And it went from meth to the pills in Tijuana to heroin real quick. And I and I was totally strung out. I don't care where you are in your recovery journey. The hill I will die on is the 12 steps are a worthy endeavor. But on the way home, we spoke for about two hours about drugs and alcohol and how bad it is and what it can do. And we're talking about 10 and nine years old. We need to meet people where they're at if we hope to ever Mm -hmm. see any progress in this venture for a safer way. But we shouldn't leave them there. I'm Flint Anderson, founder of Pain, Parents and Addicts in Need. I've been in recovery since 2001, and there isn't much I don't know about recovery. And my mission is to constantly tell the truth about addiction, to make the realities of addiction, recovery, and drug culture known, and to drive awareness and advocate change that ultimately saves lives. And I'm Jason Lachance, a certified recovery coach with a passion for speaking with others and sharing their knowledge to help others seek recovery and maintain long-term sobriety. And this is the Don't Hide the Scars podcast, presented by Pain, parents and addicts in need. On this episode, we're revisiting some of our fellow podcasters in recovery. We're talking with Dave Mannheim from the Dopey Podcast, as well as the amazing and wonderful Arlena Allen of the One Day at a Time podcast, and she is also a recovery coach. We also have Gary Minkies of the Begin Again podcast, and we speak with our friend Daniel Hearn of hard knocks talks hope you enjoy this episode make sure to check out the full episodes all those links are in the podcast description and while you're at it hey please subscribe to us on uh, youtube give us that thumb up leave a comment in the comment section and please share with someone you know will get value out of this podcast as well as subscribing on apple podcast and spotify where we would appreciate a rating and a review Dave from uh, the wonderful Dopey Podcast and Community. Thanks for joining Founder of Pain, Flynn Anderson, myself, Jason, on Don't Hide the Scars. Oh, thank you. It's always good <laughs> to see you, Jason and Flint. Flint seems like a very happy person, so thank you. I'm happy to be here. It's a thrill. <laughs> We're glad you're here, Dave. We really are. I needed to laugh today, that's for sure. Uh, no, I told him, I said, I said, you're going to love Dave. And I can't think of a conversation we have that we don't laugh. And it was kind of like, Oh, thank God <laughs> we could have a sense of humor about some of this shit. Yeah. That's, I mean, I find it's just my way of coping and, and sometimes it's not the best way of coping. I'm sure it makes my wife insane that I need <laughs> everything to be a joke. All I mean, it's like, it's, it's an asset and a defect at the same time <laughs> for sure. But uh, it, it gets me through my life, you know, like if and, and it's gotten me through pretty much every part of my life. I mean, at my worst, it was still pretty funny, <laughs> even though it was really horrible. You know, I, could, I couldn't resist. So, and, that, and that's also the basis for our show. You know, we started our show uh, to laugh about the dumbest and, and mo- we'd say the dumbest shit we ever did. That was like our slogan uh you know dopey on drugs addiction and dumb shit but if you if it, if you were not you know one of us it would be way worse than dumb shit it would be horrific it would be awful it would be just mm-hmm. the worst thing you ever heard and we we enjoyed laughing at it and and that's kind of our shtick for lack of a better word mm-hmm. yeah i i think we can relate in that <laughs> a lot of us in recovery we've got a dark humor about it i mean like you said, it's it's it it's coping. I was in a, a classroom, you know, I spoke and kind of told my story. We, you know, got conversational. And uh, this young lady goes, when you talked about your car accident, like where you, where you did it intentionally because you didn't want to live anymore, you were like smirking the whole time. I'm like, in retrospect, it's all I can do about it. It's like it, the reality of yep. like, what was my logic? Oh, there wasn't any freaking logic here. Well, if we don't laugh about it, too, at some point, we're going to cry about it. I mean, so I, I'd rather laugh than cry. That's for damn sure. Yeah, and I feel like if I had the choice, I would I think I would choose to laugh. And, and 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 you know, it's it's weird how connected laughing and crying are like whenever I laugh like real hard, I'm crying by the end of it. It's 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 triggering not like grief but such a cathartic reaction in my body that tears are coming out of my eyes and it's, it's wild, you know? And I, I think I, I smirk when I tell those stories too, because 
I don't even know what that's about. Like, I think that's an interesting question right there. Why do we smirk when we tell those stories? I mean, part of it, I, I imagine, is it's like, fuck you. I'm going to tell my story and you're not mm-hmm. going to judge me and I'm going to smirk at you. And part of it is is what you said, Flint, like, how can we choose between laughter or crying? Like, that's 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 an interesting thing in itself. It's, it's, it's a crazy, crazy thing. Like, uh, how far we go and then what we're left with, you know, like when I was a kid, I was in, uh, in a math class teacher's name was Mr. Kissack. Shout out to Mr. <laughs> Kissack. If he's listening to the don't hide the scars podcast. Um, he, 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 me and him had some kind of oppositional relationship. And in my school, if you did badly, in the beginning of the quarter, they would send you a one subject report, right? Like to let your parents know that it's not going well. <laughs> and, uh, and he wrote this one subject report about me. And it wasn't about that. I wasn't good at math, which I wasn't. And it wasn't about like that. I was loud or obnoxious, which I was, it was <laughs> David. It was like something like David disturbs me with his evil smirk. That was the one subject <laughs> report. That when I was in eighth grade, and I'm sure it's similar to your smirk, Jason, when you talk about that car, the car wreck, it's this weird thing that people do not know what to make of that face. It's yeah. fucking weird. <laughs> I, it. <laughs> uh, I got to know, well, you know, Flynn on the, on, on the podcast, Dave will have on uh, his dad a lot, which I love. Uh, if we ever do go to New York, A, Delhi for sure. B, uh, fuck you. I don't need to meet you. I need to meet your dad. <laughs> Uh, just kidding. Okay, that's fair. Uh, <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> that's fair. But uh, how was like mom dad response? You and I have not talked much about like childhood Dave. You know. Um, my it's funny because I went to a a twelve step meeting this morning, and the meeting was about it was a daily reflections meeting, and it was all about blame. The daily reflection today is uh, a word to drop blame. And on the show, I will often, well, it's like this. When I became a drug addict or or when my drug addiction was in its height, you know, that question of why, what happened, like, and, and, you know, you go to rehab, what happened to you? And I, I really had a hard time putting together why I was a drug addict. I grew up in a middle-class Jewish uh, family in New York City. My parents were both teachers. Um, when I delve into my, it's like, I'm not I'm, I'm dopey. I love to blame my father for my heroin addiction. <laughs> I think it's funny uh, and it makes him crazy. And, and I think it's also just counter to the fact that when I was coming up as a drug addict, they didn't blame themselves. They blame me like, <laughs> right. and uh, you know, how dare they blame me? <laughs> but, uh, but like I was raised in like a kind of classic. I, I was born in 1974. Uh, I had two parents in the television set. And I think I would, if I could have hugged and kissed the television set, I would have done it. Like I, I was, I had a TV in my room. You know what I mean? Like I, we would have meals together, but I was in my room watching TV like a junkie. You know what I mean? And, uh, and I went to this really, really great school. Uh, from a very early age, when I was four, I got into it. And my when I was a kid in elementary school, I remembered my mother would say things like, I'll scrub the floor so you can go to Harvard. And uh, by the time I was in seventh or eighth grade, when I'm getting one subject reports about my evil smirk, it's getting to be kind of clear that I'm not going to Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, it's not going to happen. So, um, my 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 mother was very overprotective, uh, very controlling, somewhere between overprotective and controlling. And one of the great statements of my friends, like we I would have friends come home with me all the time and they and they would always say, I, I never want to answer your mother's questions because I know you're going to lie so much that I have no idea what you're going to say. <laughs> and, and, and I just lied so she wouldn't be on my on my head. Right. You know, I lived in Manhattan. I, I grew up in Chelsea. I went to school on the Upper East Side. And she would get annoyed if I if I took a combination of trains and buses home that she didn't think was the right one. 
So like it was like it was a lot of control. She if I dressed a certain way, whatever I was doing, she was she, it wasn't like punishable. It wasn't punitive. It was just a lot of talking at me, a little bit of a lot of a little bit of criticism. I didn't do well in school. So there was that, too. And um, I think that that impacted my self-image. Right. Sure. I mean, like, I don't I really I'm not looking to blame anybody except my father because I enjoy it. But I don't <laughs> think it was I don't think it was really their fault. I think it's a concert of experiences. I don't I mean, all of my friends, I would say the majority of my friends had parents who really doted on them, who thought everything that they made was this incredible thing. And I didn't have that experience. Um, but that I mean, that's my childhood. Like it was it was a great middle class Jewish childhood in Manhattan. I had two loving parents who definitely did their best. I had an older sister who I was not close with. Um, we had scrapes here and there. And I had a group of friends, like a really intense group of friends. And I would say, like, as I've done my own analysis and exploration into my addiction and my psyche or whatever, I think I was codependent way before I was addicted. Mm -hmm. Like I and I was super codependent on this group of friends. Uh to the point, and I, and I, like I said, I started that school when I was four. So my group of friends came together at like five, six, and I'm still tight with those guys, yeah. but it yeah. fucked me up a bit, you know? And I can relate to that. I, I've, yeah. I've said that many a times in self-examination, I was an addict before I was an addict and I can just see it from the behavior. And as we've talked about, you know, the porn exposure at an early age and it, it it was just it was just a combination of things of perfect recipes. Mm -hmm. I mean, Jesus, you know, perfect Flint, storm. Flint, you waking up, uh, you know, being born and going right into surgery yeah. and and you know, surgeries for God, was it seventeen years straight? You know, um, thir thir uh, for surgery. What? Um, I was born with an ailment that um, that caused me to. I had to have a go right back. I was born, bam, back in the operating room. Um, and it had to do with my bladder and urethra and those kinds of things. And, and so they had to go in once a year, uh, for the first 13 years to, to repair the, the my insides. Mm -hmm. And then I had four more surgeries in 76. That was all in one year. Uh, so I was basically in the hospital for the entire year of 1976. Um, and then I've had, wow. I think, I think I've had like 17 or 18 cents then along with a couple heart attacks and a couple open heart surgeries and shoulder surgeries and knee surgeries and all that nonsense. I think I've had, I, I've held Dave, I've lost count. I think it's 34, <laughs> you know, all together, but have to have a couple more. Um, so yeah, talk about, you know, moms that, you know, that, I mean, first of all, doted on my ass, you know, the, the entire time. Um, but I was also on an opioid for, for, you know, short periods of time uh during that so my opioid receptors were fucked up from day one um right that's interesting yeah i i mean just you know looking looking back um it was again uh, both my parents were teachers as well and um you know but but because of those surgeries and my dad had to work like you know three different jobs because you know on a teacher's salary you know back in the 50s and 60s i mean that was that was just crap um yeah. So he had to do that. My mom stayed home. Um, but God, I was always being taken to that fucking doctor for something. I mean, I've got this, this love of this love hate affair with, with doctors. I, I, I really do, you know, um, cause when, when, when I was using in the height of my using, I was doctor shopping, you know, this is back in the, in the eighties and nineties, um, that, you know, doctors were just writing scripts like there was no tomorrow. And hell, I, I would make friends with these with these doctors. Of course. Why wouldn't you? Right. <laughs> right. I mean, I was I was in the produce business for a while. I'd take them over. I'd take them over dried fruit or I'd take them over, you know, grapes and, you know, those those kinds of things. Do you hell, golf, Doc? Hell yeah. I knew where <laughs> these guys lived, for Christ's sake. Um, yeah, it was, it was pretty interesting, to say the least. Yeah. I didn't have to make appointments. I just walked fucking in there, you know, and yeah. Was there, was there like any kind of cantaloupe for Delauded? system <laughs> <laughs> the was too short acting i i, I wanted i wanted the longer lasting stuff you know so what was uh, your what was your what was your thing it was well any opioid to be you know to be honest with you but when when vicodin hit the market that 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 was it and then of course i discovered you know some other like lortab the things that would take up to 10 milligrams or, or more 
um, right. The, the last two years of my using that's, that's really the whew, shit. I mean, I was taking between 70 and 80 every day. You know, it yeah. was, yeah, it was, it was nuts. And if there were more, I, I, I would have taken more. Got to give that shout out to Granville for those that don't know. Nine nonprofits benefit greatly from Darius Asemi and the Granville Home of Hope people. Um, they give away a home every year uh, free to one lucky winner, um, which I've never been. And, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you also have a chance to win it. A, a, a lease on a Lexus for two years, brand new, uh, given by Fresno Lexus. It's a great, or, they're great organizations. They're great people helping out nonprofits. And 100% yeah, of all the tickets that each individual nonprofit sells goes directly back to us, which is unheard of uh, in, 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 in our world, so to speak. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, and, and it helps us tremendously. So you can call it, you can call us at Payne. You can uh, go to our website. It'll tell you how to, how to buy the tickets and uh, help us out so we can uh, continue to try to save some more people here because folks, it's, it's not slowing down. It's not getting any better. So uh, make sure that uh, that you get your tickets from pain, please and, uh, help us help others. You know, as, as they say, uh, God helps those who help themselves. No, God helps those who help themselves then help others. And uh, right. hey, we need your help helping others. So please join us in this fight. To my right, the founder of Pain, Flynn Anderson. Of course, I'm Jason Lachance, and we're joined by the lovely host of the One Day at a Time podcast, and I dare say a friend, Arlena Allen. How are you? Yes, sir. Uh, I am very well. Thanks for asking. Thank you so much for having me back. It's always fun talking to you guys. You bet. Oh, yeah. We, we've been reviewing like people that it's just like, oh, lots of value. Great come. We have a good time, and you were top the list. So I'm like, I'm reaching out. <laughs> seeing how you doing. Still considered a good time gal. <laughs> <laughs> and sober her, what, 30 years now? Where are you at? Almost 30. Yes. 29 and counting. My anniversary is at the end of April, but pretty sure I'm going to make it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's like I always, when somebody asks me, how long do I have? I always kind of sit back for a second, you know, and go, oh, okay, how do I really answer this? Because a lot of times... I'll, I'll say, cause I'll go, do you ever have the urges? And, you know, and, and I almost have to cover it up sometimes because I just want to say, no, I don't. Okay. Y you know, but in recovery, everybody assumes that we've always got to be on our toes and, you know, and blah, blah, blah. And I, you know, again, I think we always have to be aware to, to a certain degree, but I think you reach a certain point in your recovery where I, I don't know, I'm like that, where it's like, God damn, there's no way I'm going back. You know, <laughs> yeah. there's just no way. I don't care. Yeah. I don't care what the situation is. Listen, call it vanity, but I'm not, I'm not I don't want to do the beginning over again. <laughs> right. Plus I actually, I don't have any desire every once in a while. Like when my son turned 21, we were at a restaurant, this fancy restaurant, and they brought him out a glass of bourbon that had like this smoke thing. It was really, yeah. it, the way it was presented was super cool. It was like a little tray and it had a drink and, and the, you know, the big round ball, but it, they f had smoked it. So there was like a, um, a container over it, like a hurricane jar over it filled with smoke. And they brought it out and they lifted the thing and all the smoke went everywhere and it smelled amazing. And, and I was like, oh, that's weird. I would really <laughs> like to have a sip, <laughs> but that, that's as far as it went. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. No. I, and uh, like, I've been having some, some different struggles right now. And I was, uh, you know, on with my sponsor yesterday. He's like, you're sober. Right. And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, okay, everything's fine. I'm like, it wasn't even a, it, it's not even a thought anymore. Like, oh my gosh, I have oh, all these things that need to be done, taken care of, organized, processing of feelings, all that stuff. And it's not even a thought. But but yeah. we were out for a, a a Christmas party the other night, and it was like, you know, everybody's getting the the whiskey or whatever it is, and it's like, oh yeah, I used to like that, and it's 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 pretty much that quick now, mm -hmm. you know. And I'm not saying yeah. it'll always be that. I might call Flynn one night at ten o'clock. Hey, I really need to talk, buddy. You know, so it's the, the hyper vigilance of it's shifted a bit. I yeah. guess I would say. I don't know how else to put it. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, the shift. I feel like after a while, the shift is like I don't feel good. Like I'm upset, and I need to. That's when I pick up the phone. Right? It's like when I don't feel good, I feel squirrely. Uh, like it's largely about emotion management. After a while, like I'm not thinking about. It's not about handling cravings or anything like that. It's about how do I get back to a peaceful place. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's interesting you say that because. For- for me, it's ne- it's I, I'm just gonna say it. People probably think I'm fucking nuts, but um, uh, I don't I don't have cravings. I I I I I just don't. I have these I have these little like my wife just had some uh, work done on her teeth. Okay, and of course, I mean she despises all pain medications because because of me. Weirdo. Right? <laughs> right, right, right. Weird. Okay. Um, um, but, but, you know, she's got the pills. I mean, okay, they're there. I, I, I just don't care. But this morning I'm sitting outside in my patio, I'm having coffee and yeah. And it's not that I was feeling squirrely. I was feeling overwhelmed Mm -hmm. by just some business stuff that's, that's going on, you know? And, and I, and and again, this is going to sound maybe a little weird to people, but I don't care. I, I, all of a sudden there's, there's a, there's a singer named Jordan Smith. I don't know if you've, you've heard of this guy. And he say, I, I love the song, Mary, Did You Know? There are so many versions of Mary, Did You Know? Um, it's it's a faith-based song. And this guy sings it like nobody's business, like, like I've never heard before. And as I'm sitting there and I'm listening to this and it just popped, it, the, the song just popped up. All of a sudden, I everything just went just, just, just went down. The, the anxiety went down. It all went down. And, and again, that's, that's, that's my spiritual place. That's where I go, you know, and, and it all just went away. And it was like, Hey, (laughs) you you don't, you don't have anything to worry about here, dude. You know, even though there's worries off to the side, shift, right. It it was, it was, and I mean, that shift, I mean, the, the minute the song started, Everything shifted to the for yeah. the better. Well, yeah. I think it's that, that... Music is so powerful. So powerful. Yeah. yeah. I, I just created this uh, 30 tips for 30 days. You know, it's like how to quit mm-hmm. drinking. There's 30 tips for your first 30 days. And the second or third tip was create an empowerment playlist because I feel like there's that old saying, I forget who says it, but it's uh, music speaks where words fail. Mm-hmm. And there's something about music that can just strike to the core of us. Like you were saying, it just set you right quickly, so fast. You know, when you can't get someone on the phone, when reading something spiritual or something inspirational doesn't do it for you, music, music will, sm- that's part of the motion management. It just smooth things over, puts things right into perspective. Oh, a- absolutely, it does. I, I mean, mm-hmm. it's it's yeah. This is the, the 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 song. Obviously, is Mary. Did you know? And his name's Jordan Smith. Jordan Smith. I'm gonna look it up. It sounds really familiar, but I'm gonna check it out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, uh, there's a there's there's another faith based singer. I've heard him, Stephen Curtis Chapman. Oh yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, and and so when I was when I was in uh, the Betty Ford Center, I mean, there's there's a few. I mean, I love most of his music. Um, but there was a couple songs in particular that literally got me through like that first two to three weeks, you know, that I was, that I was there. And, um, and he came to Fresno about five years ago. And if you notice in my office, I've got pictures of, of, with me and him. And I went right up to, I, cause I don't care. I'll walk up to anybody. And I walked right up to him after, after the show and, and, um, uh, and, and, and I told him, I said, you know, your, you and your music was, was, was instrumental, you know, in, in my early recovery. And he just, I mean, he lost it, you know, right on the spot. Oh, yeah. It was, it was, it was really cool, yeah. you know, but yeah, awesome. I mean, music just has that power that I think most people, you know, a lot of people need to listen to more of it, to be honest. You know what, you know what did it for me? My first 30 days, this was a long time ago, but there was a band called Enigma, yeah. And mm-hmm. there was a song called A Return to Innocence. Mm-hmm. Don't be don't be too proud to be strong. Uh don't be afraid to be weak. Uh I mean, it was it just I listened to it on repeat for a long time, but it was sort of like the paradox of recovery. It's like it actually requires a lot of strength and courage to get sober. Sure. 
Maybe some people perceive it as weakness, but it's really an act of strength to seek help, you Mm -hmm. know, and it's this return. It's a return to who we really are. It's a shedding of things that no longer serve us. That is the return to innocence. And that's what, to me, recovery was about for me. It wasn't that I developed into my ideal future self. You know, you see a lot of that. And and, and I kind of like that idea. It can be useful. But really, it was about returning to who I really was Mm -hmm. without all the survival skills that were no longer serving me. For me, it was uh, Jeremy Camp faith-based mm-hmm. artist and his song take my life because yep. it was it was a rocking song which was kind oh, yeah. of unusual for you know some of it and i heard that and it really for me it was about helping that surrender part mm-hmm. like uh-huh. i gotta turn uh, the, the, i gotta turn this out like i'm getting chills just remembering thinking back to the feelings i had like i don't know what it means to turn it over i don't know how to do that and hearing that right. song it was like oh yeah wow Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. in my arms, just. I feel like the turning it over thing is uh, finding something else to do while you wait. <laughs> like, mm. like, in the sense yeah. of, um, you know, uh, surrendering was like, okay, I'm not going to do the things I used to do. So I need to find something else to do instead. That's kind of along the sufficient substitute. But it was like, okay, I, it's so much easier to surrender when you know what you are supposed to do instead, what's going to take its place. And um, yeah, this surrender doesn't mean you don't do anything. Right. And surrender doesn't mean you're weak. Oh, no, it's so hard. I mean, listen, letting go is so hard, but we do it when we have something better. And that's the trick is we need something better. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and talking about surrender, like, you know, we were, kind of pre-discussing folks maybe being deterred by going to 12-step programs. And I know yeah, through your work and you've been podcasting yeah. longer than myself and this young buck. So you've kind of heard yeah. every story of, of people just, I don't know, no, I'm not doing that. And of course, I always hear through me with my experience, tell me what you, Flint, is but, well, I don't want to be a part of any religion. And it's like, huh? that was it was so funny is, OK, so I'm writing this book called A 12 Step Guide for Skeptics. Right. People are very skeptical. And there's usually a few reasons that people give for not wanting to go. One is and I wrote a few. I thought we'd address like the major ones. It's like not admit. I don't want to admit I'm an alcoholic. Right. right? Um, it's a religious program or dare I say cult. People, <sighs> people love to throw that four letter word mm-hmm. around. Um, people also struggle with the idea of powerlessness and unmanageability because a lot of people are, you know, are claiming they haven't hit a rock bottom. There's this idea that you have to hit a rock bottom before you can change. And I I would argue that I I don't, I think the rock bottom is when you stop digging, but I'm sure you guys have some ideas about that. I think the funniest one is I don't have time. You hear you hear that a lot. <laughs> it's like, are you are you kidding me? You realize when you quit drinking, you have you will have more time than you yep. want to do with. Right. So, yeah. So Agreed. I don't know if you want to tackle the first one is uh, admitting I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> Yeah. You know, I just I just never had a problem with that at all. I mean, it, it's like, I mean, I, I mean, OK, I, I'm a drug addict and alcoholic. I mean, OK, what's what's the, what's the big deal? I, I mean, gee, you don't think I am one. You're the ones that are screwed up. OK, if, if you don't think that I'm a, a drunk and an alcoholic. I mean, I, I don't get that one. I really, really don't. Well, I, sure you do. I'm going to challenge you there because okay. you I, I know you have met people who have their shit together. They haven't lost a job. They, yeah. they haven't lost a marriage. They're not sick. They're like, I don't think I need this. The same, that's for those people who are really sick. So I just did an interview with a gal that talks about high functioning alcoholics. And um, and again, it's like, it, it, they, they, um, they have a problem admitting that there is a problem, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, they, yeah, they do. So, you know, the idea is, you know, that we want to meet people where they're at. And so that's when I think the question has not, the question has not been answered, which is, can I moderate? Mm. Some people are really stuck 
on the idea of can I moderate? And I think that's a very important question to answer. I was I was yeah. like you when I when I got sober, when I finally showed up to it took me two years of experimenting with moderation. I didn't know that that's what I was doing, but it took me two years of mo- trying to moderate before I finally came to the conclusion of like, I can't, I can't do this. Right. Same, same. Yeah. And so whether you call it alcoholic or you're on the spectrum of alcohol use disorder, or you just want to be alcohol free, <laughs> you yeah. know, that's. That's the decision. That's the question you have to answer is, am, can I moderate? New Perceptions North, the premier drug and alcohol treatment and recovery center in Central California. A full continuum of medically supervised top quality care with programs for detox and patient residential treatment with dual diagnosis, intensive outpatient treatment, sober living support groups, and more. New Perceptions North provides adult men and women with the highest caliber of professional health care, treating each client with compassion and respect in a safe, comfortable environment to begin the process of recovery to proudly create and sustain a life without addiction. Call 559-978-1507 or visit newperceptionsnorth.com. Uh, founder of Pain, Flynn Anderson, and of course myself, Jason Lachance. We welcome the host of the Begin Again podcast, Gary Minkies, to the uh, to the pod, to Don't Hide the Scars. What's going on, my friend? My friend, it is a pleasure to be here. Flint, it's good to be with you guys. I love what you're doing. Uh, I'm grateful to be here, sincerely. Thanks, Gary. We're glad you're here, buddy. We really are. For those just listening, make sure you look at the thumbnail photo because Gary's an example of what long-term recovery does. That's a silver fox right there. That's, you know what I'm that's saying? exactly right. <laughs> uh, I'll take it. You know, like I tell my other buddies, hey, man, at least I got it. You know what I mean? Right. right. It's gray, but I got some. <laughs> uh, heck yeah. uh, you and I, we've kind of had some different talks and, and um, it was interesting after the last time we had had any longer conversation, I had a couple people reach out about, you know, recovery coaching and asking and this word that keeps coming up, big hot topic button, authenticity mm. and working with people. And the best that I could come up with is it was about authenticity is about getting complete. Like we're pretty fractured people. And the reason that I want to start here, I mean, you and I both grew up in homes of addiction and yet we still maintained relationships with our fathers after the fact. And a lot of Mm. people have asked me like, why? I'm like, getting him out of my life wouldn't have completed my life. It wouldn't have closed that gap of that, the trauma and everything else. Sure. Yeah. I mean, how do you kind of view it now? I mean, you're what, 17 years sober, 18? 17 years, yeah. May 6, 2006 is my day, my sobriety date. And it's amazing to say, to be honest with you, still, you know, I like to keep it like, I like to reflect, or, or maybe it's just happening to me, Jason, but I, I really, lately, I've been really going back to like where I was 17 plus years ago. Um, and, you know, it's just such a gift that, I don't live that way anymore, you know, but, you know, if you're asking about authenticity, right, it's, it's a really cool topic because when I was out there, I think I was anything but authentic. I was hiding. I was fearful of everything. I was, uh, you know, I would do things morally bad. I would do things uh, that would get me in a lot of trouble. And, you know, authenticity to me, you know, as a questioning, like on the spot, I think it's, it's just the deepest, most real, open version of myself for the world to see. And it's not, and sometimes it's difficult. It's not me trying to hope that Jason and Flint are going to like what I'm going to say and that they're going to like me as as much as I sincerely do want you guys to like me. I do. It's just kind of how I am. I, I, we, Jason, you and I hit it off from the beginning. You know, I like, kind of love you, man. I do already. We, we know each other for not long. And, um, you know, but in in all sincerity, I think that's what being authentic really to me is. It's just being totally real and um, you know, not trying to be something that the other person uh expects of me. It's just this is, you know, this is me. And you know, this recover out loud, this term, I think we touched upon it last time we had spoke, is a is a fairly new term to me, recover out loud. And, you know, I think I had mentioned, you know, I, I went from like I, 
you know, no social media. I wasn't, I, I didn't really care for that to like completely, as you guys can, can uh, attest to, you know, opening up in public about my, my battles, my scars, where it was my story. And, you know, that is, that's authentic. And we do it. And I know you do it, Jason, because we talk, we do it with the hope of helping one person with this story today. And, you know, to me, that's, you know, if you, if you and I sit down or I sit down at a podcast or, or at a meeting and there's a newcomer, whoever may be, and we have a sincere, want to sincerely help that newcomer that just walked in the door. Like that's as authentic and real and beautiful as, as we can get. I think that's a good day for, for everybody. Yeah. You know, I love what you just said. And I think one of the, one of the things that, that I try to, um, Try to get across, especially to, let's just start with the newcomer for a second. Uh, and we've had this conversation with a couple other people on the podcast before as well. I, I always revert back to, you know, I got clean and sober in 2001. I didn't even start to think about doing what I'm doing now until 2008 and then started it in 2009. And I, I, I believe that, again, everybody's different. But, you know, when you're in that first six months, that first year, and I see people posting all over the place that, you know, I've, I've got I, I've got five months and 22 days and 16 hours and three minutes and 22 seconds. OK, it's like what I want to tell them is great, but take that sign down, get off of social media and work on your recovery until you have and i don't know exactly what the time frame is but until you have enough time under your belt where if you screw up and by the way most of us are going to mm -hmm. you're not going to put yourself in a position of not ever coming back loudly and proud about your recovery does that make sense makes perfect sense. You know, as you're saying that Flint, I'm thinking to myself, well, number one, I wasn't on social media, but if I was, and I was, you know, uh, I'm different. I'm a different cat. Maybe we're this, I'm maybe just a little older. I don't know what it may be, but you know, I think that's just, just staring, looking at that. That's a difficult, you know, that's a, that's a difficult road to be, you know, and I, and I see it too. We all see it all the time. Hey, you know, I've been sober for 12 months. I'm ready to start helping the world and this and that, right. and be a coach and all that stuff. And, you know, Jason, I, you and I talked about that again, kind of offline, some of the people that we see and, you know, I, I'm not judging anyone, but again, on, on, on the topic of, of authenticity, you know, if someone asks me, how did you do it? Right. And this is what we're taught in the rooms is, is just to tell my story and how it worked for right. me, you know? So, you know, there's, there's, there's more ways to get this done. There's more ways to skin the, the cat, if you will. But if someone's going to ask me, I'm going to tell them how I got sober. You know, and sure. I got sober in, in Alcoholics Anonymous and that's, you know, and I went there, I was in and out for four years and I was never going to go back to that place again because, right. you know, I had it all figured out and <laughs> maybe I'll, maybe I'll have to stop drinking one day, but I'm definitely not coming back in this room. And I found myself in May, you know, 12th, 2006 in a bad place in my apartment all alone. And I called Intergroup New York City and I went to a meeting on the very next day, May 13th, 2006. And I haven't had a drink since, you know, as I give, I was given the, the difference. I was, I was, I believe I was given the gift of surrender. Like, and you mm -hmm. talk about like the time frame just now, Flint, like what it is, you know, I think it's different for all of us. It was, mine was long. Like it took me so long to even realize that even though going through the steps, like there's a, you know, obviously there's a, a there's a higher power, you know, com com I mean, it's a huge component. It's actually probably practically 90% of the program, but I was just so like, tunnel vision is I just didn't want to drink again. That right. That's all I was there for. I didn't want to drink again. And right. I was terrified probably over a year that I was going to fall off. I was going to go back out again. Sure. Sure. Yeah. We don't even know. We don't even know at that point what authenticity is. No. That's I mean, I, I didn't know whether to shit or go blind the first three years. <laughs> I, I, I mean, ser seriously. I mean, right, I can you see this? <laughs> All right. So we know which one it was. <laughs> I mean, authenticity. I mean, shit. I was just worried about getting my ass up in the morning. Right. Yeah. Right. 
and just and and worried about getting through my day, having to go back back into the workforce immediately. I was 45 when I got clean. So, you know, I mm-hmm. still had a young family. I still had a wife. I still had a career I had to get back to. I didn't know up from down. Right. Sure. And and so I, I think that as as again, like I said, it's different for everybody, but I'm glad I waited that amount of time yeah. because and Jason knows this. I didn't even want to do this. <laughs> I mean, I'm, yeah. si- I'm I'm sitting around in my last treatment center and everybody's going, I'm going to be a counselor. I'm going to go out there. I'm going to develop this app for AA and I'm going to do this. And I'm going, are you kidding me? I go, I all I want is out of this fucking place. Right. OK, I mean, that was the last thing on my mind. But it's amazing how, you know, my higher power, I choose to call God. It's amazing how he works. It is. All of a sudden, yeah. lo and behold, somebody asked me to speak at some deal. I I do it, and next thing you know, I'm in the middle of this. Fifteen years later, and going, what happened to the time? <laughs> well, I think, I think he brings such a valid point, especially we're talking about those people. Is the wonderful perception of social media behind the reality when you have the person that's uh, 185 days, you know, whatever the heck, minutes, seconds, so on and so forth, and people might have this kind of perception i know because i was that person Mm -hmm. and you know what was happening behind the scenes i just simply wasn't drinking Mm. i wasn't recovering Mm. but i wasn't drinking right and i thought they were the days i thought they were the same thing yeah and i think that's some of the danger that gets out there because i luckily didn't have anyone other than encouragement like reach out like wow how'd you do that can you help me I, I couldn't even help myself. How the hell was I going to be able to help anyone? So I, I think I got fortunate that the arrogance of how I was re- approaching recovery uh, never backfired in being asked by anyone else to help them. And I think that's where some danger really comes in is, is like, wow, man, you, you did over a year. That's really great. Well, if you've not worked something, and I'm not saying it has to be a 12-step program, but if there's not been an evolution of the individual – you're not yeah. going to be able to help anyone. And I'm speaking from my own standpoint because here I was and Flint, this will always stick with me when I started here was this is not your recovery. And that was the key mistake that I made with doing the other work I'd been doing and was thinking it was. Right. And then what happened a year and a half later? I had a slip up right? because I wasn't right. doing the work. Yeah. You know, I, I've been in I've been in a place where I was really close. You know, I had mentioned I was, uh, you know, I went to rehab when I was 26. I got sober when I was 31. So like, again, those four years were just a, I mean, you know, the whole, you know, all the ter- terms, you know, a belly full of booze, my full of, of sobriety is a really difficult place to be. And I'll raise my hand. That really, really is, you know, when you turn people off, you shut them off. Yep. Like I was like, at one point, I was like, I don't care what side of this team, of this Gary team you're on. I really don't. Like, but this is who I am. You can either come along and be a part of this, or you can go over there, and I don't really care. And these, I said these things to people I loved, people that are really important to me, because I was just, I was a miserable, drunken, bad guy on my on good days. You know, like, at worst, you know, just what they say, institute, jails, institutions are death, like. You know, and that's where I was too, you know, and that's not like, uh, you know, blasphemy, like that's real, you know, that again, that's authentic, even though it's hard to even say, cause you know, and you talk about, you know, again, I was saying I, w- I was in the rooms just to not drink, like it took me so long to realize like there is, you know, there's a full transformation going on here. You know, like talk about the word authenticity. If someone asked me like, are you being authentic? Like my first year, I would have been like, but get away from me. Like, I don't even know what that word is. Like, I'm just here to like, you know, to not drink, you know, but I think I might've said it last time. I say a lot amongst my, my friends and my, in in sobriety is, you know, there's no big sign when you walk into a room, so, you know, whether it's a meeting or, or a rehab, there's no big sign that says, Hey, come on in, man. You can completely change your life. You know, like that's not like why we're going there. We're going there because we're, lying on the floor or the curb or we lost everything or we're in the midst of losing everything or we're going to die or we're going to jail, all of it, like all of that. And that's why we go crawling into these rooms. And what happens is, and I know you, for you guys, you know, we, our lives have been transformed. We get yep. a second chance, you know, sometimes it's like, man, 
why did I deserve a second chance? I mean, this is a full blown second chance on life. You know, it, it really is. is. And, and, you know, all the people out there that are doing what they're doing, whatever works. Like Jason, you were saying you, you, you did post that stuff. You know what? And, all right. You slipped, but you know what? In the long term, zoomed out, like it's, it's worked for you. Cause look where you are now. Right. Like, yeah. and then Flint, I didn't know I pop the word podcast. You know, I've been doing it for about, you know, almost six going on six months is I think I'm in my sixth month of podcasting. Like the word podcast was not even on my radar. <laughs> right? like having a microphone was nowhere right. here. Like it wasn't, I like listening to podcasts. I like all sorts of podcasts, you know, you can tell by my wall, a lot of sports stuff, but right. it's a, you know, I really quickly realized that there's a higher purpose here, man. And like, when I found that I can maybe help more than one person or helps again, the mantra help one person today. Like, when I, when I, it, it, it just really quickly was way bigger than me. Like even before I started, you yeah. know, I think I told you about, not to even talk about the podcast, but like I wrote this mission statement, Flint. And like my wife has heard every crazy idea that I was going to come up with, <laughs> in the last 20 years. you know, like everyone. And she's just like, you know, oh, great. You know, but this one, I was like, what the hell am I going to tell her now? I'm going to podcast about my sobriety. I'm going to be telling people, you know, I've been arrested and all this, you know. They're going to hear my story. I, I wrote out the mission statement. And she's like, you know what? Stop everything else that you're doing, Gary, and go do this because this is you. And like, so I hadn't, I had that from my wife, like that support and that pushing. And that, that's sometimes all I need. Yeah. But again, this was, this was bigger. There was something bigger. It was, this wasn't all Gary. It was my higher power. Why? Well, like the, I choose to call God as well, Flint. That was, okay was working here and dot org follow us on social media on facebook twitter instagram and tiktok at pain nonprofit and please subscribe to the don't hide the scars podcast and share with others wherever you get podcasts and on youtube and if you would like to donate to pain parents and addicts in need please click the link in the description to make your tax deductible donation today and help us save more lives gripped by addiction Daniel Hearn of Hard Knocks Talks. Thank you for joining founder of Parents and Addicts in Need, Flynn Anderson, and myself, Jason Lachance, on Don't Hide the Scars. What's up, Danny? Hello, thank you for having me. Not, not much. I'm happy to be here today. Um, all of the technical things worked out, and uh, we're, we're, here doing, we're here doing the thing, so it's a good day, man. <laughs> yeah. For those that don't know, have not viewed Hard Knocks Talks, I know you've shared some of the memes and I stuff that, yeah. that Daniel's posted, but... Daniel has the holy shit studio of studios for podcasters. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, it's uh, it's phenomenal. And you do amazing work. And we'll definitely get into the starting of Hard Knocks Talks a little bit yeah. later. But would you would you like a virtual tour? <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Here. So that's my studio. Nice. <laughs> I know it yeah. sort of looks like a mad a mad scientist's lair right now, but that's uh that's uh where we're that's at. That's fabulous. And, um well, we'll get into the story of how it came to be, I'm sure, as we move along. Perfect. Uh, absolutely. Uh, we were talking, though, when I did Hard Knocks Talks a few weeks back um, about harm reduction. You're like, I, I've got a strong stance on this uh, based upon facts and experience. You know, I mean, gosh, we talked to such a variety of people of yeah. different stuff. And, and Flint and I, were, prior to jumping onto this, we're just like, there's so many people that are harm reduction they don't even know what the hell they're talking about they don't even have the right. facts to to as we've adopted here tell the fucking truth about it right so danny what's your take on it man my take on harm reduction um well the it my my take on harm reduction has changed uh, since i've started doing uh hard knocks talks um i i used to be of the the variety that would just believe the loudest voice you know, mm -hmm. um, they must be true because they're all over the TV and they're all over the news. Uh, but as I as I started interviewing more and more advocates uh, on different sides of the fence, so to speak, um, I, I noticed that over the past couple of years, the pendulum isn't swinging as as far as it used to, because it, it, it used to be sort of like abstinence is the only way or you're going to die. And then it would swing all the way to the other way, which would be like all the drugs are the only way. And if you don't do that, we're all going to die. You know, mm -hmm. so um, it's important to realize that we are supposed to meet people where they're at. And in fact, we need to meet people where they're at if we hope to ever mm -hmm. see any progress in this uh, in, in, in this venture for a safer way. But we shouldn't leave them there, in my mm -hmm. opinion. Right. 
You know, um, I, I am not against a, a safe supply. I, I'm not against that. I believe that it definitely has a spot on the spectrum of care. Uh, I'm not against safe consumption sites. I also believe that there is a, sp a space for that on the spectrum of care. But the idea of being able to buy a gram of fentanyl alongside my bottle of whiskey, um, that this that just doesn't sit right with me. I don't know what your thoughts are on that, you guys. I, I've actually changed uh, a, a little bit in my direction as well. You know, I'm the old, old, old man, the, you know, the hard line, you know, abstinence is everything. Uh, mm -hmm. I do believe in that where we have to meet people where they are. Love that line that we don't have to leave them there. I, I, I think mm -hmm. that is extremely well said. Um, now, I do believe in short term harm reduction and mm -hmm. what and what that short term is. I'm not quite sure. But we all know that if and, and again, we were talking about this before we came on, you, you know, harm reduction, it, it's like a huge umbrella to me. And there's all kinds of different categories that that fall underneath that umbrella as it relates to harm reduction. Harm reduction is wearing your seatbelt. You know, har, har, harm reduction is, is having a uh, Narcan in your in your car, in your office, in your house. But but harm reduction falls under different categories, such as um so so it prevents sexual disease. Um, but now you have, OK, harm reduction is related as to drugs and what and what that looks like. So so there are these different categories. But it seems to be me to that everybody's putting this under this one umbrella. It, and I hope that makes some sort of sense. But what nobody is talking about, at least where I've heard. They're not talking about the effects of harm uh, of long term harm reduction, the medical effects, the 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 potential fractures, the potential uh, uh, sleep disorders, the potential uh, bowel instruction uh, or, or, you know, in infections and to where you can't crap, you know, constipation is so bad with that. Nobody's giving that person the other side of, of the real story here. And I think mm. that's what really, really gets to me the most. Everybody's jumping on this bandwagon, Danny, and 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 you you see it, and and they're not even in the fight on a daily basis. Yeah, yeah. and 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 that bothers me as well. Well, and I I think that the 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 fight towards a, a an effective harm reduction strategy has become glamorous. Yes, in mm. in our in our fields, you know, uh, um, it came on so hard and so fast and so loud that, that everybody is like, Oh, I want to be big and shiny too. Yeah. Harm reduction. Yeah. Safe supply. Yeah. Decrim, uh, all, all of these things, you know, uh, safe and regulated. Um, but nobody really knew what that looked like. Right. Like, yeah. like you, you, you'd sort of alluded to there already. Uh, what, what should a, a safer supply look like, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and, and how do we manage the perception of harm? When we talk about uh, when we talk about uh, the the harms that have come to our society through through alcohol, you know, uh, they're saying, oh, so many people were dying because of prohibition and people were making gin and bathtubs and people were uh, going blind and, and there was a lot of harm. So they just they regulated and legalized it. But now nobody's talking about how alcohol kills more than than every other illicit substance yeah. put together. Why aren't right. we talking about that? You know, and, right. and that and and is that the standard? Is that the benchmark that we want to achieve with all illicit substances? Like, really? Yeah. I, I'm not so sure, man. You know, and and like I said, you know, it's important to leave. It's important to meet people where they're at. And that doesn't and, and you know, throwing up barriers, saying like, you're not clean if this or you're not clean if that is not productive. It Correct. is not productive. In many cases, there are some people out there, not unlike myself, if we're being completely honest, that needed a good ass kicking. And I still do lots of times. Like ask my mom, <laughs> she kicks my ass around all the time. I don't think that's ever going to go away. <laughs> you know? But that's the thing though. That is the, the, that is why we need to broaden and, 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 um, and, and, bridge the gaps in our spectrum of care. Some people need that old school, hard ass AA mentality. Yeah. You sit down, you shut up, you work the steps and abstinence is the only way. Right. I'm abstinent. That, that's personally what works for me, but I've been around long enough to know that rock bottom is a luxury that so many of us are, are being depraved of. You know, we're, yes. we're, we're, we're leaving this earth before we have an opportunity to find our bottom.
And one of the other things that bothers me, especially when if you want to get to the quote, the political side of this, you know, when especially here in California, when we have politicians that that are that are literally telling people, you know, maybe you ought to try snorting fentanyl instead of injecting it. And there, so, as God as my witness, it's as true, as Danny. God is my witness, and calling that harm reduction, you know, that to me is criminal in in itself. I mean, Governor Newsom back in 2020 made a statement at a press conference that America completely screwed up by trying to get people clean and sober. He said that was the biggest mistake the United States has ever made. I mean, uh, yeah, he was he referenced to a, uh, to every night the nightly news uh, what, having that having to self medicate with some wine before watching the news. Right, and he said everybody sh- needs to self medicate from time to time. I mean, the message that these politicians here in California are sending something needs to be done. Okay, uh, uh, mm-hmm. about that, and then they wonder why we have a problem. Well, and that and that goes back to something that I I didn't really unpack is the perception of harm, you know. Right. And um, right. I and I brought that I brought that forward with the uh, with in context of of how the how alcohol is wreaking havoc on our society today, you know. Um, that it's okay to have a couple of drinks to self medicate sometime. It's okay to you know. And if and if we regulate and and release these illicit substances in an unfettered way, um, that is going to send a message that these substances are somehow not as dangerous as they once were and will open it will reduce the barriers in that it will uh, reduce the perception of harm and will open the door to a whole new level of mm. um, of people experimenting with these very dangerous substances. Yes. Right. Well, and you bring a good point. Me as an alcoholic, I've joked about this. What would have been my my pathway of harm reduction? OK, right. we're going to give you two shots of vodka tonight. That's it. <laughs> and we're going to. Mm-hmm. But yeah. also with the decrim, you know, people decrim, decrim. Great. So what you're telling me is when we do that, then we're going to immediately take this as a mental health issue, which it is a health issue. Mm-hmm. And we're going to effectively do something about this health issue. They're just mm-hmm. wanting to go, no, decrim. So it's going to be fine. Like what you're saying is, OK, we'll continue to do what's done in San Francisco where people in L.A. where they're allowed to just go ahead and shoot up, snort, whatever on the streets. And as long as, you know, but they're no longer in jail anymore, but it's fine to leave them on the fucking streets. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Where's that yeah. middle of the road? Where's where we actually start to address this as a mental health issue and focus mm-hmm. on it in that way? OK, I'm with you this that that if you are not the dealer, per se, that's responsible for killing so many people, but the user itself, where's the point then when we treat it as a mental health issue and actually do something about it? Mm-hmm. Because of, for now, it's just people going decrim. Great. To do what? Yeah. And then like where, where, <laughs> uh, and I, I don't mean to laugh because this is really a tragic situation that our nations are in. But mm-hmm. um, I, I was having a conversation last night with, uh, he's, he's an ex-drug cop here in Saskatoon in my hometown. Uh, he's now a, 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 de- a sergeant. He's a detective. Uh, and in his career, he's been uh, in in con- close contact with the the drug economy and the drug trade and the uh, gang culture in Saskatoon here for nearly 17 years. And he was saying, you know, in in our neck of the woods, we've already decriminalized small amounts of of, of substances. You know, right. like we're if, if we it's a de facto law is what what they called it, is that we just won't arrest them. You know, if, if somebody and I and I don't, I'm almost quoting him, but like if somebody goes and is scrounging for cans and and doing everything they can all day long just to get that little tiny piece of joy in their pocket, taking it away from them isn't going to help. It's going to increase the harms in the community because now that person is going and and, and robbing your garage. He's stealing your bike, you know, uh, to to yeah. go and get some more. So but taking the way taking away uh, the officer's right to to choose could also be harmful, you know, Mm -hmm. like, okay, let's leave this in place so that if that person is in a bad place mentally, if that person is getting ready to jump off a bridge and all we can get them for is that little bit of dope in their pocket, that might save their life. We can arrest them and we can, you know, then um, try to open the door to services for that person, you know? Yeah. So, so removing that, that off of the table out of the officer's toolkit, so to speak, I mean, the way you want to look at it, I mean, there might be more harm coming from that than good. 
Right. Yeah. Right. 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 You know, the, the the other thing is is that when when most of these people are talking about this, they really don't understand the addict's mind. They don't. Mm. They don't understand how we uh, how, how we think about this. And and what I mean by that is this. You know, look, there's 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 not a drug out there I haven't done except for methamphetamine. I just was I mean, I did my coke. I thought I was Pablo Escobar back in the 80s. Oh, you, you know, got to you got to try it. You got to try that. <laughs> shit. <laughs> you are missing but, out, my friend. I'm missing out. <laughs> but but, you know, again, any opioid, inclu- including, you know, methadone that, you know, it took me two years mm-hmm. to get off of that. I mean, and I had to do it by myself because these methadone clinics, they're not treatment centers, they're maintenance centers. And and I mm-hmm. wish they would just say that because it's it, it's it's they're they're in essence, in my opinion, lying to the public, saying we're 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 a treatment facility. Well, no, you're not. Okay, you're just kind of keeping everybody on this thing and not really pushing them towards abstinence. But and here's my point: as as an opioid addict on methadone and. If I had and 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 if I was in this in this world today, where harm reduction was this big thing, look, man, I'm not only going to use the methadone, I'm going to use all the opiates that they're selling outside of the methadone clinic. I'm mm. gonna I'm gonna use my Vicodin. I'm gonna use my Norco. I'm gonna use whatever it is, fentanyl, heroin, whatever, mm-hmm. because now I look. They're gonna drug test me, and what's gonna pop? I mean, that's that's just that's just one side of it. But until people start to understand these minds and 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 we're almost opening up the door for us to continue with our with our use. I, mm-hmm. I, I mean, I know everybody doesn't agree with me on that, but I'm here to tell you, like you, Danny, I mean, we know the, the opioids mind, o- opioid addicts mind. Mm-hmm. We know how we think. And if we're if we're given an inch, we're going to take that mile while we're still using something and how, and, and, and so how, so how does this even, I don't even see how this is going to work to be honest with you. I really don't. If, if somebody can tell me I'm all ears. .org. Follow us on social media on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at Pain Nonprofit. And please subscribe to the Don't Hide the Scars podcast and share with others wherever you get podcasts and on YouTube. And if you would like to donate to Pain, Parents and Addicts in Need, please click the link in the description to make your tax deductible donation today and help us save more lives gripped by addiction.